What is up? This is Culture FC, the weekly soccer show that's not really about soccer. We cover lifestyle, music, fashion, politics, all the things surrounding the beautiful game, just none of the results happening on the pitch. My name is Louie. My name is Eggie. And this week, we sat down to talk about the Revolution Chelsea charity friendly that the two of us attended last week and what it means for American soccer and just kind of a little bit of how it went. But before that, we got jumped into Nike releasing a special apparel collection for the different women's national teams that they are sponsoring for this year's World Cup. And along with that, we talked about Chattanooga FC, a a fourth tier American club hosting Real Betis in a friendly this coming weekend. This is a pretty big Spanish club making the trek overseas to play a team from a smaller city in Tennessee. And we talked about what that means, what it is, and really just try to dissect that a little bit. If you enjoy this episode, we really appreciate an honest review on your favorite podcasting app. We are always trying to get better at doing this show. And that is your best way of letting us know how we are doing. If you want, you can even send us a DM or an email of how we can get better with the show. We are always listening. You can also follow us on all of our social medias at Trouble Soccer, as well as checking out our YouTube page where we post weekly videos about American soccer. And that is also at Trouble Soccer. I had a really fun time recording this episode, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. So enough of my rambling. Let's jump into this week's show. All right, so <clears throat> before we jump into this week's news, last week uh, we talked about Juventus's New Jersey, and recently I saw something on Twitter that really caught my attention. Uh, but before I get into that, Egg, what are your thoughts on Juve's home kit? Overall, I liked it. Dope look, nice little pink stripe down the middle. Shies away from tradition, but I was surprised at first. I was about to say I was surprised at how they shied away, but after seeing them change their cl- their club crest recently, they're clearly going for more modernization of things. For some reason, don't know why. But overall, I like the kit. It's a good look. Anything on Cristiano Ronaldo is gonna look good to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> pretty yeah, pretty much. Yeah. The dude can literally <laughs> wear a, a potato sack and it would become fashion the next day. But True. um <laughs> you basically hit on what B and I said last week. And so uh basically what I found what, what I saw on Twitter that really caught my eye was it's rumored that Juventus chose their new half and half mm. kit because of research showing that Americans associated black and white stripes with referees. <laughs> and so then the guy, the, this, uh, it's a, it's a guy who dedicates a news account to Italian soccer. He then said, just to clarify, because there seems to be some confusion, market research showed that Juventus's jerseys weren't selling well in America because they resembled the uniform used by referees in baseball and American football. So the change was partly due to that. How does that affect how you feel about this? Because it's so strange. It's almost it's like that commercialization thing continued. It's like yeah. they see that there's a massive market here in the States that you know people are rabid soccer fans mm-hmm. here and they want that and they want to be able to buy um iconic stuff and in a way it's kind of endearing that they're trying to adapt to the american yeah. market but doesn't it feel weird yeah i'm surprised by that because personally let's say i had a ube kid on if someone looked at me like oh dude nice breath shirt i'd just be like you're you're ignorant you're an idiot right like it wouldn't bother me one bit you know what i mean i'd just be like, all right is that clue there's nobody he's talking about i don't know that that seems like a little like a lot of effort just to appeal to the American fan base. But like you said, it is kind of endearing. Because it's like, yeah, I, I agree with you. From a soccer perspective, if you don't know, I can't really even think of another club that wears black and white stripes consistently. No, yeah. I mean, Newcastle and then the yeah, Juve. True. But uh, other than that, I mean, it's pretty iconic mm-hmm. when you look at black and white stripes. At least in soccer, you think, cool, Juve. Yeah. But then when you think about it, people show their interest with their money, right? And it's part of that whole Juve redesign. And the reason they redesigned their crest was to become more appealing to a global audience. Yeah. And so then they realized that majority of the money that is currently being spent potentially on soccer merchandise, at least there's a different avenue here in the United States where there is a lot of money being spent on soccer stuff. They were like, you know what? Let's try to capture more of that money. It's like, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. I understand what they're going for and trying to appeal to the American market. I don't blame them. You know what I mean? UA is a massive club. If they can tap into that potential, it can only take them so much further. But still, I don't know. I feel like they're a big enough club where their appeal and their their brand, their jersey, can be bigger than a referee's 
influence. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they shouldn't be worried about referees, American referees. They're a pretty damn big club. You know I what think I mean? There was a different way of going about yeah. this rather than skewing away from the tradition. Mm-hmm. I think it was more of a power play in a sense where like if they were to just take the long road and just expose more American viewers to Italian uh, Italian Serie A soccer, eventually Americans would just start paying attention. Oh, for learn. sure, for sure. But that's almost like a long run play. This seems like it was like a hey, let's do this real quick. We're gonna in one year we're gonna stake a huge claim in the American market, mm-hmm. and then from there we will be. I don't know. It, it just seems like they're like let's just make a shortcut. Yeah, yeah. Like, and what do you do? You go back to the stripes after like. Do you go back to your referee look next year? Uh, I guess it's not as controversial if you think about that. They can't yeah, just true. go back. They can't just the really just bring her back and say, "Hey, Adidas, run it back, yeah. make us the old thing again." Especially because then it becomes, you know, once they've captured this new American audience that they're trying to captivate, they can just revert. Yeah, they can just really jump right back. So, huh. it's re- and no one will bat an eye. That's true. It's really not that risky a move of a move. You know what I mean? Either it pays off for you and you 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 grow you grow your your brand and everything, or you just say fuck it and you go right back. Yeah. It's like, okay. yeah, wait, okay, we took one loss, but we'll take a win in the long run. All right, I, I see 200 IQ plays by Juve here. They're, <laughs> they're playing chess, we're playing checkers. For I real. get it. <laughs> but overall, the jersey itself, I'll say this, is dope, I thought. It, I think it's a pretty dope kit. I, I wasn't as captivated last week, mm-hmm. and then I kept reflecting over the last seven <laughs> days since we've recorded it, and I saw it over the weekend again. And Yeah, seeing it live it, and like on the pitch is a lot is a huge deal. It looks, it looks good on the pitch, yeah. if you ask me. And I'm starting to kind of come around to it. I'm still, I still don't like the fact that they, skewed, they, they really steered away from the tradition and the heritage, but overall, I mean, clubs have done weirder things, I think, and this is just another one that, that I guess is all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> <laughs> you bet you're good. Don't worry about it. Yeah, but all right. Moving along to, I guess, our first real news topic of this week. Nike have launched an entire apparel collection for both the England women's national team and the French women's national team, as well as following that up with an entire Women's World Cup apparel collection. So we spoke recently about how Nike has designed unique jerseys for the Women's World Cup teams that they are sponsoring uh, this year. It is the first time that they have made jerseys that are specifically made for the women and for the women's Mm -hmm. national teams, rather than what they used to do before, which was uh, create a kit for the men and then just adapt it for the women. And like we said before, they're dope. If you haven't seen them yet, take a look. They're pretty damn sexy. They are phenomenal. Um, Beautiful kits. And Nike is really doubling down on that, and they are releasing apparel collections for what it seems like all of their uh, teams. You know, they started with England releasing that one first and then releasing the French one, but I believe they might try to do it for all of the countries. I hope they do. I hope so. They got to capitalize on the hype. Oh, for sure. For sure. Is a lot of hype going on. And so, as for the collection itself, it's really dope. Mm -hmm. I was thoroughly impressed with like the kits and everything they did. I thought those, they knocked us out of the park. They went a step further with these collections. Like these collections, these whatever you want to call them, whatever they, they released are magnificent, excellent, whatever other big, <laughs> big adjective you can think of. They are dope. Right. And especially because we talk a lot about where fashion and soccer meet. This kind of seems like exactly that. You know, mm-hmm. Nike is the athleisure kind of leader in yeah. this, right? Oh, they, without a doubt. They have like all of the coolest leggings, coolest both through men and women, all of their designs for like athletic wear is usually in the cutting edge. Oh, for sure. And so what they were able to do was take the crest, the insignia, the designs that they had made for the women's teams and attach them to some of the coolest athleisure items out there. And essentially, we as men who support soccer understand this already. You know, we, every club, every country releases stuff that you could wear every day with just their crest i mean if you're watching the video version of this i'm actually currently wearing a (laughs) brazil top that has the old school crest and i didn't realize this when i put this on but hey it worked out um you don't don't lie it was planned don't believe him guys (laughs) (laughs) and so Basically, we understand that it, it, you want to wear stuff that you don't always want to wear a jersey to support your club, yeah, your yeah. team, your country. Sometimes mm-hmm. you just want to wear something casual that still does it. And so that's what Nike kind of went for. But they took the dopest designs they had just made and adapted it with this. Yeah, dude, I couldn't agree more. Like the amount of like, obviously I'm a huge Chelsea guy. The amount of like jackets, like sweatshirts. I don't, it's not just jerseys that you want to wear. You know what I mean? I have literally an entire closet I could pick from. And I love that. I love having that choice. The fact that they went into this for the woman's side is phenomenal. And I'm surprised it actually took so long. But I Yeah, guess it, same, same. Especially because usually women's fashion is mm-hmm. way more at the forefront than men's fashion yep. is. 
I guess it just has to relate to, I guess, the popularity of women's soccer, which is kind of getting to potentially it's not necessarily its peak, but it's on its way. Yeah, up oh, definitely, right now. it's at its all time high. It's, hopefully, it's only going to grow from here. And definitely hope it doesn't peak here. No, no. <laughs> Continue hoping it continues uh, from strength to strength. And then, uh, as for the entire World Cup collection that they released. They basically took it then a step further, and instead of focusing it on athletic apparel necessarily, they used athletic apparel as just like a canvas and created really dope modern fashion uh, items using some of the design elements that they had used in the Women's World Cup collection. I don't think it's as much of a winner as the specific team collections, but I still love that they are mm-hmm. doing it. They're trying. They're trying, they're trying and they're going fashion. for it. You know what I mean, like they have a like a cheetah print jump suit made out one. of like a leggings and a top which <laughs> it's bold but i don't know how many people are going to be wearing that no out. I, I yeah i i can't if i see somebody anybody about out and about that i'll respect it absolutely but i might <laughs> i might chuckle a little bit and then there's like a fishnet top that is i don't know it was strange yeah but, but also yeah. remember this we're two 25 year old males what do we really know about <laughs> women's fashion you know what i mean <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're saying this stuff, and this could be the coolest stuff Nike's ever let out for women, and we have no idea. <laughs> Personally, you won't see me wearing it. I promise you that. <laughs> you know what? That's a, that's incredibly yeah. fair. I. <laughs> what do we know? Uh, let us know. Maybe you love this collection, and we would love to hear from you because, again, we are not women. Mm, we're just two 25-year-old males. I don't really even know, but we really don't <laughs> shouldn't have an input on this one. But I will say this: I think the England, the England collection they released, like the color scheme and everything they did, is just so. The France one looks great. Don't get me wrong, but something about that England one, just it's head elegant. and shoulders above. It's beautiful. It's elegant. It's mm-hmm. classy. It's it has really nice elements, and it's like modern football design. Like if this, what I keep thinking about for this Women's World Cup is. All of the memories that each of us as soccer fans have from a prior World Cup, like yep. from when we were yep. kids, the style sticks in your head. Like for me, uh, that you know, that 2002 Brazil jersey, it had weird ass hexagons on it, but yeah. it will always have a place in my heart because it was when Brazil won the World Cup yep. when I was alive and I got to witness that as a kid. And I'm sure it's the same for a lot of people. You have that aesthetic that you're attached to because it's what you remember from when you were a kid. I keep thinking that it's going to be so incredible for a young woman or a young boy, even any any young child who's watching the Women's World Cup this summer, seeing this dope stuff that Nike mm-hmm. made and understanding the significance behind it. And then thinking about like, imagine in 25 years, this is going to be what some people remember as like the oh, style yeah. of the World Cup. Absolutely. From that Absolutely. Year. And I think that Nike and even Adidas for all of their designs for this women, this year's Women's World Cup have been stellar. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be really huge going forward in the future when people just looking back on these designs. Exactly. When you go back and look at pictures and just see all the stuff Nike allowed, like you're just going to remember how dope it was. And the fact that Nike's kind of the first to really be going forward and doing this, you know what I mean? Like they're going to get credit for pioneering this really, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, and it's really, really cool that they're doing it. But all right, guys, moving along to our next uh, news topic, something that's actually happening uh, probably about three or four days after this episode gets released. But a couple of episodes back, you might remember that we spoke about a club here in the United States called Chattanooga FC, who had been selling shares of their club to basically allow anybody who wanted to be an owner of the club to become an owner, to give the ownership of the club back to its supporters. And it it was a really good success. Well, Chattanooga FC are hosting Real Betis over Memorial Day weekend in a friendly. And so let me rephrase that for you so you can maybe understand this. A semi-pro club from the fourth level of of the American soccer system from a non-major U.S. city will be hosting and playing against a club that just finished 10th in the second best league in the world. Chattanooga FC, let's go. Punching above their weight class with this one. I, I also just want to meet the man who made this happen. <laughs> Same. I want to know like who reached out to who, who agreed in everything. Because these two guys are just like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to Tennessee. But where are we going? We're going to Nashville? Absolutely not. We're going to Chattanooga. Can Spaniards even say Chattanooga? Oh, no way. No way. <laughs> Any Spaniard, I will put money down. You'd be like a pure Spaniard from Spain that you cannot say it. Anyway, I think it's an it's absolutely incredible that yeah. this is going to happen because not only is this going to possibly help put Chattanooga FC even more on the map, but what you have to understand is that Real Betis has never played a game on U.S. soil, and one of their first games is going to be against Chattanooga <laughs> FC. 
So when clubs come oh, from overseas to the United States to play these friendlies, it really does wonders for their it fan It does. Base. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're looking and listening to two guys who support Man United and Chelsea respectively who have loved it every time our clubs have come to the States. Yeah. And it has actually really helped us become bigger fans and supporters oh, of those clubs. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And so... Real, uh, Real Betis, it kind of makes sense as to why they want to come to the States and play a friendly, but then you're like, why Chattanooga? That was my, that was my thing. Like, I get why they're coming to the States, you know what I mean? Grow your brand, grow grow your club, pick up some fans, hopefully, just kind of make yourself more of a more appealing on a global stage. <laughs> but Chattanooga have where you decide to go to do it? Which is which is awesome. Like, don't get me wrong, we're not trying to talk. Yeah, I'm not about talking exactly. Yeah. It's just I really want to know how this connection was made. And of course, uh, Real Betis is also playing DC United, so that mm-hmm. does make sense. Right, and, right. You know, they are coming here for two games, but what is weird is the timing. And we're gonna see this again with our main topic for this week. But usually, clubs will do friendlies in July or in right August. to get ready for the incoming season. And so it's strange that La Liga just finished this past weekend. Yeah, and yet this week coming weekend, Real Betis are playing another game. In ten in Tennessee in the United States, like it's they're basically playing two extra games after the end of their season when they just played so many games. Right, right. And now I, I really got to think: why would each club kind of agree to do this? Because it will be great for yeah. both clubs in a way, but why now? Exa- yeah, I agree. Like the timing is a little weird. End of May, like I don't really see the benefit to either club of doing it. Other than just really growing your, grow, again, growing your brand. But yeah. I don't know. All I know is Chattanooga FC, I hope you win. <laughs> that would be a story. Especially because uh, Real Betis are the only club to win away at both Real Madrid and yep. Barcelona this season. Yep. Real Betis, they're, they're an interesting little team. They are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so then what Real Betis had to say about this friendly, uh, they were quoted as saying, Chattanooga FC is a young club with a lot of potential and great interest on expanding on the U.S. soccer market, said Ramon Alarcón, the Real Betis general manager. It will be a fantastic opportunity for Real Betis Balompié to play in the central southeast market with a large Spanish-speaking community, and we are excited to enjoy the atmosphere at the Finley Stadium on the 25th of May. Huh. And so the my only guess as to why this has taken place, I guess, from the Real Betis side is... Real Betis has never been a mainstream Spanish club necessarily. Yeah. They're from a big yeah. city in Spain. They are. They have a ton of fans and a ton of supporters. But what's interesting is that, you know, the Spanish media are always focused on Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, Barcelona, even Sevilla itself. And sometimes, and Valencia, of course, when they were a little bit more relevant, you know, they have slacked a little bit in recent years. But Real Betis has never been that. They've always kind of been an outsider club. And so maybe they looked at it and said, you know what? Let's do outsider tactics. Yeah. Why not partner with a club that isn't in the top division of American, quote unquote, top division of American soccer, but has a weirdly large following for something that isn't at the highest level? Yeah, that's a good point, too, actually. Maybe, they, maybe they're maybe they seeing something here that's as like untapped potential. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, Chattanooga FC has been able to raise $700,000. This is a yeah. small club from Tennessee had, where it was able to raise $700,000 in ownership for their for supporters from across the world and so clearly they have a reach through that and through their social media efforts and I actually think this might end up being genius for I think so. Betis if of course Chattanooga FC capitalize on their potential yeah. if it's done right marketed right and just and the the event overall goes well i think it's, i think it's huge for both sides i think both sides are making a smart a smart choice doing it honestly especially because it's a self-fulfilling uh prof- prophecy in a way right yeah. if real betis come over and play uh, against Chattanooga FC and that really blows up that game in a weird way, Real Betis is making Chattanooga FC more famous. Yep. Because more people are going to, like us, we're have, we have a podcast, we just talked about it, we are now going, oh my God, they are playing Chattanooga FC. And so now people are going to start paying more attention to them, and in a weird way, that will eventually help Real Betis back. Exactly. Because then, all of those fans that started to support Chattanooga FC will then be like, well, maybe I can have a Spanish team too. Exactly, exactly. Maybe you watch a Betis game or two. Maybe when you're in Spain, you catch a game even. It can only help them. And so it can only help. It's it's a sneaky good move. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's, they hedge their bets. They're going to play a, an established side in the MLS and DC United. Yep. But they're also like, let's take a riskier move. Right. Just like from, from looking at it, from the outside looking in, you're kind of like, huh, weird move. Like, why would they do this? Once you really like dig into it and like look at it, 
genius by both sides by both sides so it's it's a win-win no matter what happens you as long as you put on a good event have have a good game good good friendly it's a win for everybody Absolutely. And, you know, Chattanooga FC has proved that they can pull in the numbers because a couple of years back when they were in the final of their uh, league, they pulled in 18,000 people, wow. which for a soccer match in attendance, pretty, yeah, pretty damn no big. matter where you are, Flat out for a soccer match in Tennessee, in, in pretty big, for, you know, for a soccer match in Tennessee, that's enormous yep. for a soccer match anywhere else. That's still very good. Yeah. yeah. You know, you have big clubs in Europe that unfortunately sometimes don't pull in. 18,000 people. No, not at okay, all. Okay, I'm not talking upper echelon, but right, I'm right. thinking, you know, sides that are in the lower half of the Prem, sides mm-hmm. that are in the lower Wait, half of the Liga. In the fourth tier of the, of the, of the US? Yeah, they, yeah. Technically, so anyway, I'm, league... I'm sure there's four, there's teams in the fourth tier of, in England that aren't pulling in 18,000. Sure. Absolutely not. I'm sure of it. And so, either way, I think this is a phenomenal play by both sides, and I hope this game goes off very well and without a hitch. Uh, And I can't wait to hear about the aftermath of this because, like we said, it could be a very sneaky good play by Real Betis. Yeah, I agree. But alrighty, guys, moving along to our main topic of this week. We just talked about how Real Betis and Chattanooga FC's friendly seems to be very weirdly timed at the end of the season. Another friendly that was very weirdly timed was the New England Revolution versus Chelsea FC charity game. Last week, Egg and I attended the New England Revolution and Chelsea charity game. It was a game to raise money for anti-Semitism and anti-hate. So, you know, there's a massive Jewish population here in in New England. So it seemed fitting that they would play here, but the timing was super weird. It was on a Wednesday night in the middle of May, three days after the Premier League season had just finished, and exactly two weeks before the Europa League final that Chelsea has to fly to Azerbaijan to play in. Yuck. And so, as for the Revs, they had just fired their head coach and were playing on a Wednesday night between two MLS games on yeah. either weekend. And so, suffice to say, weird timing for both teams. But before I get into all of that, I really wanted to get into your perspective, Egg, about what does it mean as a Chelsea fan from here in the States who has supported Chelsea for many, many years? Was a Chelsea fucking tattoo on your shoulder? <laughs> yep. What did it mean for you to watch Chelsea play live? Flat out, it meant everything to me. Like, I mean, you you saw it. as soon as that game ended, like the players coming around to applaud, even trying to even get down there and even getting to meet David Luis and Marcus Alonso. Like, it was flat out. I was like a five a five year old kid on Christmas morning. Like, I'm a 25 year old man. Don't get me <laughs> wrong, but that's seeing those guys, seeing my team, and cheering these guys on, these guys on for 10 years now. You know what I mean? Finally getting a chance to see them live. And sure, it was a friendly against the Reds. Would I I would love to be at an EPL game at Stanford Bridge? But guess what? They were here, got to see it. It was, it was huge. Literally, like anyone that gets to, if you ever get the chance to watch a team you support locally or anything, take it. Doesn't matter. Pay the money. It's worth the experience. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to. Egg looked at me when we were there, and he said, "Man, if y'all weren't here, I'd be crying." <laughs> and, and I stand by that. I would have been. And that meant so much to me to hear that because that was mm-hmm. just incredible. Um, but. One of, I'm sorry. One one of my friends got a video of Hazard coming along, like applauding everybody. I'm applauding back, and like you can just see the. Obviously, he's most likely has one game left. I'm gonna be honest. I'm. I know he's probably going to Real. <laughs> I get it. But seeing him come by, knowing like, man, this is one of the last times I'll see this man who has brought me so much joy these last what seven six years he's been with the club. This is one of the last times I get to see him, and especially in person, man. Ugh. And it was it was incredible because I want to give Chelsea full on credit because. I several weeks back I had mentioned to Egg like, hey, have have we ta- have we seen the lineups? Do we know yeah, who's Chelsea bringing? Yeah. What's going on? I I really expected a dull down team. I really really did. I was expecting U eighteen kids mm-hmm. and maybe some of the like fringe same, players same. in the squad. And then I remember I remember uh, seeing the news and texting Egg. I was like, hey, uh, the lineup or the squad just got released. They're bringing everybody. I remember pulling up. I was like, I was like All right, Luis has everybody. This man, this man's exaggerating. And I was like, wait, no, they are bringing <laughs> everybody. And what was even more surprising is they started everybody. Yep. yep. I think the only player that didn't play off because he's injured was Angola Conte. Really, he was the only like key guy that wasn't part of the game. And what was weird to me was we're like half an hour in. Chelsea had was up, I think, one zero or two zero at this point. Yeah, and. When when you would think that Chelsea would pull their players, no, the Revs pulled their starters and subbed in a bunch of kids. They literally subbed like five <laughs> guys right out, <laughs> as if they were the big team. I was like, "What are you guys doing? Stop it!" 
It was, and I looked over at Egg and I was like, well, this is so weird. This is such a strange thing that's going on. It's almost disrespectful to, from the rest of the Chelsea. <laughs> I was sitting there, I was like, hey, 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 what are you doing to my team right now? Stop that. Um, And that was incredibly weird to see. And Chelsea kept their strongest squad out until halftime. And then yeah. they made some subs at half. We, yeah, we made three subs. We subbed in... Emerson, William, and there's one more sub that I can't remember. Off sub. Oh, Loftus Cheek got subbed. Which in. brings us to our next point, and yeah. this was probably the biggest uh, red mark. Oh, for sure. On the entire game because it's, it, uh, this was what should not have happened, and what a lot of people were kind of warning. Yeah, that happened. And it's a one thing like you you booked these friendlies, and you know like oh there could be a final. Again, I'm sure they they expect they want to be in the final. They obviously they didn't expect to not be in it. But you don't expect this to happen either. You know what I right. mean? Like you and really, really don't. It just it killed. Like again, from a selfish point of view, I loved watching them. I loved seeing my team in person. But the Chelsea fan in me sits there thinking, "Fuck, why? Why did this have to happen in this game in this moment?" You know what I mean? And so, for those of you guys who are wondering what happened, uh, yeah. Ruben Loftus Cheek got hurt towards Achilles, I believe. Right? Yeah, yeah, Achilles rupture. And that he's out for at the minimum six, six weeks. Yeah, six months. Six months. Six I months. apologize, I misread They're that. Saying. Then. They're saying six six months to be back in activity. And he probably won't see the pitch. Some people quoted it saying maybe a year. I think that's excessive. Yeah, but I. But still, either way, six months out of the game, he won't be ready for next season at the beginning. He and be I mean, there. most importantly, he won't be ready for the Europa League final, which takes place yep. in and about a week yep, or so, so he, now. Oh, yeah, he's out of that already. He's out of the the, the Nations League for England this <sighs> oh, summer. Oh, that's another one because he's been a big part of the England Absolutely. squad for this, over this a year kid now. this year was those question marks all over him whether he'd actually break into the team, whether we were kind of wasting his time. And he took he got us he got a chance and he took to it. Took that team, made that spot his like. He has been one of the first names on the team sheet for the last maybe month, two months. And then he goes out like this, dude. Like, it's killing. In a friendly in New England. Mm -hmm. He had a Europa League final look forward to. After that, win or lose, he had a, the Nations League with England coming up. Win or lose, he, ha he had a most likely a starting role at Chelsea come August when the new season starts. You know what I mean? Like, this kid had everything you work for. And he was finally showing this loan system for Chelsea. Hey, there's some guys making through. You know what I mean? Him and Hudson Odoi uh, yep. have a great season. They're breaking through. They're showing that guess what? This loan system works. And they both go down. That was like actually heartbreaking. Yeah. I felt so terrible myself when it happened. Yeah. I, I think if you guys follow us on Instagram, you probably saw because I was putting up uh, some stories on our mm. on our Instagram feed. It was, it was bad, man. Yeah, it it was. And I, I, it was heartbreaking to see. I'll give full credit to you and and to Mikey as well because as soon as it happened, I knew. I put my head down. And I was like, "It's either a knee or an ankle." And either way, he he's he's done for a while. I can just tell by the reaction that like, he's done for a while. And both of you, Mike, remember, Mike is an Arsenal fan. We play them in two weeks in the yeah. Europa League final. Louis is a Man United fan, but both of them looked at me like, "Dude, we're sorry." Like that's not at all what you ever want to see in any of these events. No, it's one of those things where where no matter what club you support, like that goes out the window for a second. You just sit there and look like, man, that that kid or. Nobody, no player deserves that, especially on a friendly match. Yep. And that really sucked. Yeah. Because young dude, exciting to watch. Mm -hmm. He is he's fucking massive. He I is think. built like <laughs> an absolute <laughs> unit, folks. We I, I remember seeing him live and I'm like, egg. I, I know I saw all the time he's a big guy, but I looked at him and I was like, my God. He towers. He's enormous. And the funny thing is is seeing Hazard standing maybe like five eight, five seven on the pitch next to a, like a six two loft his cheek, like even the half time he stares to Kepa and he he makes him look little and Kepa's like six something. Yeah, and I mean overall the whole game was weird too. So let's rewind a bit. Uh, at the beginning of the game, I looked across the field because we were sitting on the opposite side from the team benches, and I'm looking over expecting to find nice benches where the team oh would sit. Oh my god, that was you know as like a team bench because yep. it's a professional team. Um, and then I look across the field and I see metal fucking high school bleachers, like the kind that you see when you watch like a JV yep. team play. The kind uh, that they have in my local park right now. Yeah. And they, so the New England Revs bring Chelsea from England to New England three days after they play their last game in the Premier League and two weeks before Europa League final. And they make them sit on a cold ass steel bench in the middle of the rain and they can't even afford seats. Yep, yep. That was a bad look for everyone oh, for involved. Sure. For and sure. And this game was televised on Fox Sports 1 in mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, like, the Revs lately have some pretty sh pretty 
glaring knocks on their uh, reputation because yeah. that wasn't very good. I saw that, and or, I think you pointed out during the end. I, just, I honestly couldn't believe. It. I was like, "No way!" Like you couldn't have gotten something. But I, I find it hard to. You've known this game was coming for months. That's the best you could come up with. I've been advertising this game for probably yeah. since the beginning of 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 the Premier League last oh, yeah. season. Oh yeah, that, so that, long. that game without had more tenants than any Reds game this season. Yeah, without a without doubt. a doubt. Without like without you're doubt. telling me you couldn't clean that look up just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I guess it seemed like they wasted all their money bringing in real grass. To put <laughs> Apparently, over that pitch, yeah. <laughs> but, oh my god! Um, but then you you got to be asking, right? What was the purpose of this? And I was I Egg and I mentioned it during the game to each other that Roman Abramovich has been mm-hmm. having a weird kind of a couple years. Um, I think I could probably elaborate a little bit better on this than I can, but essentially he. Is he's not allowed to live in England anymore? Correct? Yeah, yeah, he's banned. I think they rejected his visa. Yeah, due to do some issues. So he was planning a huge, or obviously the club was planning a huge stadium renewal renovation. The specs looked amazing, looked gorgeous. Then they denied his visa, and he shut the project down. And so Roman Abramovich, if you don't know, he's a Russian oligarch, one of yes, the yes. richest Russian people. I think at one point he was like the second richest person in russia he was up there yeah he might have um, dropped a little bit now but he was definitely up there at one point point. and so he's not living in russia anymore and he like you said he was denied a work visa in yep, england yep. and i think the reason was for just being sketchy and i think th- i think, like I that, think yeah. the uk was just like yeah no you're not living here anymore yeah. he, and, he was he's been a staple at chelsea he's like he's he has his box his little oh, seats he's always and there he's almost at every home game and i don't, don't think we've seen we haven't seen him all the season obviously because he he just can't he can't step he foot can't in england it. And so he's been living, I believe, in Israel, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Yep, that's right. And so why anti-Semitism? I, I understand the anti-hate portion of the yep. campaign, but is there something specific about the anti-Semitism, do you think? Or is it just because maybe he's trying to appease the people in Israel to kind of like him more and allow him to live there more? Or, or what do you think it is? I think it's a little bit of both, really. I, I think it definitely has to do with his current location of being in Israel and everything. It also might be a ploy to clean up his image. Okay. A little bit because, I mean, he owns a club. He clearly wants to make this club something. He has a huge stadium renewal, kind of just sitting there waiting for his approval to go. Yeah, He wants that all to, all to go through, obviously. So if he cleans up his image, does things like this, helps him in Israel, hopefully helps him in England, you know what I mean? It cleans up his image a little bit. It helps him in the long run. Right. The guy wants the, the guy clearly wants to get back at it. I mean, I hope he does at least. Yeah. Because it's funny, right? You, you have to st- sit back and just analyze the why of this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And you're like... Why ever would Chelsea play the Revs not for like a preseason friendly, but a end of season friendly mm-hmm. for anti Semitism? Yeah, and also he donated a million dollars out of his own pocket to a foundation like yeah. for this game, pretty much. And so they during the game they announced that they were able to raise four million dollars yep. for anti Semitism and anti hate uh, charities, and. That was incredible. It was really cool, and it really brought a lot of attention to that. Especially, like I said, there is a huge population, a huge Jewish population here in New England, and so that must have been really cool to be able to participate, right? Because mm-hmm. it just brought a lot of attention to that. Especially because I feel like hate speech and anti-Semitic speech is on the rise once again, unfortunately. So, unfortunately, yeah. it was cool. But this game would have made more sense if it took place in England. Yeah, because you know Chelsea's an English club; they might be able to have hosted this game. Exactly. But then, you know, since Abramovich cannot step mm-hmm. foot in England, they were like, well, let's bring it to the States. Exactly. You know, I think that from the Revs perspective as to why they would have wanted to participate in this game is pretty, pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, the Revs have been free falling in oh, terms of popularity oh, here in New England for years. Uh, they are pretty much at an all time low, if you ask me, and their I attendance agree. is getting Agreed. lower and lower. Right before they fired Brad Friedel and Mike Burns, the GM. I remember reading online, because I'm part of some of the Midnight Riders groups on Facebook, that they literally, a bunch of people were just canceling season tickets again. And this happens every year. A bunch of people get fed up. They cancel the season tickets. Yep. Then the Revs front office will come out with some tactics, some ploy to bring people back in. And then some people will sign up again. Usually this takes the form of, hey, we're about to build a stadium closer to Boston, mm-hmm. which they say every year for eight years. And then people get excited for a little bit. And then nothing happens. Nothing ever happens. Never. And it continues, right? With this, it seemed pretty, pretty, e- pretty easy to understand because when people stopped paying attention, probably ten years ago, for those people who loved soccer in, in New England, they, when they stopped paying attention to the Revs, was around the same time that the Premier League started to be readily available in America. Yeah. And so a golf kind of 
was created between the people who support the revs in New England and the people who support soccer in New England. There are very two distinct oh, groups. Yeah. They are very different. They believe very different things about soccer. And so the Rebs front office probably looked at that and said, hmm, this is an opportunity where we can take one of the best English Premier League sides of the last 20 years, yep. bring them to the States where we know a bunch of people love them, and hoping that by them coming to Gillette Stadium to a technically a quote-unquote Revs game, it'll make people care more about the Revs. Mm-hmm. And so, in other words, standard play by the Revs. Yep. And anyone who's followed the Revs for any length of time recognizes it all too well. But I don't know how well that worked out because while there were a lot of people at the stadium, it was by no means full. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They, I, I would have expected, I, I'll be honest, I would have expected a little bit more of the seats to be filled. So, you know... In my history of going to soccer games at Gillette, I've been to a couple of other friendlies as well. Mm -hmm. When you and I went to the Man United Revs game many, many, many moons ago. Six, seven years ago, something like that. So long ago. We went to a friendly there too. It was Brazil, Portugal, if I'm not wrong. We did Brazil, Portugal, which was. That game was packed. I remember that. It was lit because it was. We were sitting all the way up top because it was so damn busy. Oh, yeah. So packed. There's a massive Portuguese population in New England as well, and a massive Brazilian population in New England as well. As well, mm-hmm. so then when they brought those two national teams, sold out Gillette. Yeah, when the Man United game happened, it wasn't necessarily, I believe, sold out, but there was probably 45,000 people there, maybe something yeah. like that, if so I remember yeah, correctly. Had to be. And then the other game that I've personally been to was the Cruzeiro versus Revs game, and that had a huge uh, support group yeah. of people there, too. And so it was weird to go on this game to this game and see that there wasn't as many people as I expected. Of course, again, the timing didn't help. It was a Wednesday night exactly, at 8 o'clock. Exactly. Where they could have picked a more prime, prime timing to do it. But Yeah. And so did both clubs achieve kind of what they wanted from this? Like Barring the injury, taking the elastic injury out of it. Because obviously, if you fact that I didn't know, we did not achieve what we wanted. Yeah. Absolutely not. But I'm going to take that out of it for the sake of the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say overall, yes. I think we knew coming over that at a time when we were doing it that we weren't we weren't looking for some huge sort of payday or anything like that. We weren't, we weren't looking for anything like that. We were just looking for the for the kind of the media attention and the, the cleaning up of, of Bromwich's image a little bit. And I think we got both of those. You know what I mean? This game was was widely talked about. Unfortunately, now it's for the injury, yeah. which sucks. That yeah. overshadowed what both clubs are doing. And the good that this game did it was, and it was. will do. Because honestly, like the, the Chelsea players, there's a local school right actually where me and Louis went to middle school, Fuller Middle School. Where David Luis, Emerson Palmeiri, and a couple other players went actually. Really? You yeah, you didn't see no. about that. Yeah, so um, they went to our th- fucking middle school, and I didn't know about. This? I was livid. Let me tell you, I didn't know. They didn't even invite alumni. I would have been in there. Yeah, but yeah I'd be in. The, are you kidding me? Yeah, it was actually it was uh, David Luis, Emerson Palmeiri, and um, Ruben lost cheek. Those three went That's to incredible. Fuller Middle School. Yeah, and what's really incredible is that our middle school has a huge Brazilian population. Yes, so there's a reason that Davos and Palmeiras were picked, without a doubt. Which must have been so fucking incredible for those young kids. Oh, for sure. I uh, bet you they gained at least 100 Chelsea supporters for life from that. Oh, without a doubt. Let me just, I'm going to show, I'm gonna show a little quick video, guys. You see them recognize the gym. It's our middle school gym with all the players in there. That is so incredible, man. No way. Yo, we've played on... Yeah. That would have been so cool, like, man. Literally, I, I saw that. And I, like, it, it's amazing. Like the Chelsea, obviously, Instagram accounts, Twitter accounts, they put that video up everywhere because you you're gonna advertise yeah. that, obviously, if you're a club. But yeah, like these guys took time out of their day. They came to see kids, local kids in the area, especially a very very popular Brazilian Brazilian school. To be honest, there's and a lot of Brazilian kids in that school. So overall, back to Louis' question about did both clubs achieve? Abs- Chelsea's point of view, absolutely. They they influenced the community a little bit over here. They they got themselves fans for life without a doubt. That's the only, the only bad speck of on the whole thing was the loss of cheek injury. And unfortunately, unfortunately. that's a massive speck yeah. because that is that's mm-hmm. awful. Just to talk about the whole thing about our middle school, for you guys to understand, you know, a lot of people when they come to New England, like they focus on the city of Boston or whatever. But you gotta understand that Gillette Stadium, where the Revs play, is not in Boston. No, it is a it is forty five minute drive if you're lucky. I'm from saying. Boston to yeah, four hours being kind, yeah. If you get it at any point where there's traffic, you are going to take forever to get in and out of. Yep. It is a Gillette Stadium is a very well built facility and place around it, 
But where it is, is in the middle of nowhere. And there yep. is one way in and one way out of this stadium. So and, traffic is hell. Organization is hell. Things are awful. Where we live is also a half hour outside of Boston. So yep. it's just incredible. I know that Chelsea did stuff in the city of Boston yeah, yep. a couple of days prior. Like yep. they visited the Holocaust Museum they did, uh, they did. in downtown Boston. Mm-hmm. And then they, I believe they went to East Boston for like another school and did some stuff there. Yep, yep. They had a, they had a, an open practice at Harvard as well so people could come watch, get autographs, stuff like That's that. That's awesome. Um, and then for them to come out to the probably the biggest Brazilian community in New England, oh without a doubt, just to do a middle school visit, mm-hmm. that's just absurdly awesome. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. Uh, yeah, that's like I said. Back to your question, like Ch- from Chelsea's point of view, yes, it was absolutely worth it. I mean, even the Reds, you know what I mean? Like you, you brought a huge club like Chelsea, you put on a, a, a good game, good event overall. Like, there was no problems, nothing other than the bleachers. You know what I mean? <laughs> We're being a little nitpicky with that one, but overall, I think both clubs, yeah, they 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 achieve what they set out to do. You know what I mean? Both Chelsea got fans for life out of it. Reds definitely got a little media boost out of it. It was, it was a good event for both sides. And I think that it worked out in terms of timing for the Rebs because they had just announced Bruce Arena as the new head yeah, coach. I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was insanely perfect timing for them. And so now it becomes, you have two kind of good stories to mm-hmm. help boost your, your ratings here after some shitty years. So, you know, I think overall good. I do wish there was more people there. And same, I wish it was same. a better organized event. But that is, yeah. you know. The, the old, yeah, honestly, getting into the stadium, I'll say, was was hell. They had us drive. We did an almost entire circle around the stadium just to find a parking spot because they couldn't. They weren't letting you in certain parking lots. And it was, that part was a mess. But from when you got into the stadium and everything, it was a great time, great event. It was. And so then I, I wonder and I think about this, right? What's the impact of this? On American soccer, because, you know, we always talk about how there's these two distinct set of fans here in America, where the ones that support the MLS sides and the sides that support European clubs. What is the impact of this game? You know, like, does it, you know, just help bridge the gap? Uh, Is this going to become a more common thing to have end of season friendly? I hope so. I mean, end of season, we'll see. But I I hope it becomes a more common thing, at least to come to the States and do events like this, because don't choose a Wednesday night at eight o'clock again. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, I think it could be huge. It, it'll be insanely popular. Because, you know, with the ICC and how yep. teams come and play each other here on American soil, mm-hmm. I think that's really cool. But a part of me would almost rather it be a club like Chattanooga FC or the Revs playing a big side because you're bridging that gap. Yeah. You're trying to bridge that gap rather than be like, hey, come see the best teams in the in the world play glorified friendlies Mm -hmm, where neither of them really care and they're just and neither really want to be there aside from the money and so it's like yes they they bring massive attention hell i flew to miami florida to watch juve play psg you know what i mean that's it it got my attention it gets millions of people's attentions it sold out the hard rock uh stadium down in miami yeah it did and it sells out every stadium when real madrid played man united in michigan two years ago yeah that had like almost what 100k people more right 9k i believe oh my god and so, yes, we know that that is a massive record breaker, but I do hope that we start getting more friendlies where it's between an American side and a European side because that's how, okay, maybe the quality of play won't be great because it's a friendly, but I think we should be trying to build up American sides a little bit more. Maybe, yeah. maybe not MLS sides. I'm hoping we start, we start doing, <laughs> you know, more Chattanooga FC versus Betty style games, but, you know, I think it could be cool. I agree. I agree. Overall, I think... I just become a Chelsea fan. I loved it, but I I think it was huge. I think it was awesome, and I would love to see more of it. It's so great, man. Yeah. I mean, it's just that feeling of just going to watch some footy. Like it just feels mm-hmm. great. Dude, nothing, nothing beats it flat out. It's so great. I don't care if it was a friendly or not. I had a. Great I said the same thing. Time. That's why after the game, I looked at Mike. I was like, "Hey, man, I was, I was like, I know Arsenal's coming. I think it's like Washington or Maryland, something like that." I was like, "If yeah. you want to make that trip, oh yeah, I'm so down." I told I'm him, totally "Sign deal. me up. Sign me up. Take a little road trip down to DC to watch Arsenal or yeah. Maryland to watch Arsenal. Same, that why not? Great. Why not?" Sit there, make make some Chelsea chance after we beat him in the Europa League final. <laughs> Come on, sign me up. <sighs> kidding, Mikey? I'm kidding. No, he's not. I'm not at all. Not one <laughs> bit. But overall, though, good experience. Loved it. It was good. Loved it. Loved it. I would. Uh, the dream is the next time it'll be at Stanford Bridge. But yeah, I loved it. Couldn't so, have. I. It was everything I could. I asked for it more. Honestly, like again, like I said, it was like a little kid waking up Christmas morning. It was amazing. Yeah. Well, 
I think that's a good place to end it. Um, it was, again, I personally loved it as well. Getting to go experience that was really cool. But yeah, but yeah, I think this is probably, you know, good place to end it there. All right, guys. Thanks again for all you wonderful fans for listening. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you think of the of Nike's new women's collection, both the England, the France, and all the, the other ones they've done. Let us know what you think about these friendlies, like big teams like Betis playing small teams like Chattanooga FC. We think it's brilliant. But again, let us know what you think. And obviously, go Chelsea. <laughs> we'll catch you guys next week.